Welcome to The Roll Forward, a podcast for the next wave of finance leaders, especially those looking to transform their roles by making smarter, faster, and more profitable business decisions using the power of technology and a forward-looking approach to finance. Listen in to learn how to get out of the back office trenches and become a more strategic partner within your organization. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Roll Forward Podcast. My name is Joe Michalowski, and this episode is brought to you by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. Today, I'm joined again by our co-founder, COO, Joe Garofalo, and our guest today is John Ludig, a principal at Founders Fund, one of the biggest VC firms in the world uh, with a portfolio that includes companies like Stripe, Airbnb, SpaceX, Spotify, you know all the names. Um, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Cool. Um, so, you know, the usual spiel uh, to kick something like this off before we dive into real topic, can you just give us a background on yourself, how you ended up at Founders Fund um, and some of the work you've done while you're there? Yeah, quick quick background on on me. I'm a computer scientist at Stanford by training. I've been at Founders Fund for five years, focused mostly on early stage B2B investing here. So, you know, anything as early as C up to up to Series B as a fund, you know, we're a lot more stage and sector agnostic. And then in terms of some of the companies I've, I've worked with, um, you know, include Scale, Rippling, Flock Safety, Figma, and uh, I guess uh, you'll be soon to learn that uh, Mosaic is part of that list as well. Yeah, uh, very happy to join the heavy hitters of names there. It's a, it's a pretty amazing list, uh, the whole portfolio, really. And so, yeah, like that, that's kind of the elephant in the room here. I wanted to normally give a frame of why someone's on the pod and for you, it's because we just raised the Series B from Founders Fund. So one, like really happy to have you as part of kind of the Mosaic family. And I know I've heard from Joe and from Beige how much they've learned already from um, the strategic guidance that Founders Fund gives. And that's that's really why you're here. We want to give that to the people that listen to this podcast. And so before we kind of get into main topic, can you just give us a rundown on, you know, what made you want to invest in you know, Mosaic in strategic finance software as a space? Like, why, why was this so interesting to you? Yeah, if, if you look at our, our our thesis, it really starts with our name, which is Founders Fund. It's a fund by founders and for founders. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're heavily founder-driven in our in our vetting process. And th- there's kind of two dimensions to that. One is just general founder quality. But I think one specific thing we focus on is, is founder market fit. And so what that means is why this founder or this team is uniquely well suited to solve this problem. And in the, the context of Mosaic, you know, we, we knew that they hit the general founder quality bar, uh, given you know, their, their history as operators at, at Palantir, uh, which is another portfolio company. But I think what was particularly un, unusual uh, or rare about Mosaic is the, the founder market fit, given they had solved this specific problems, uh, this specific set of problems multiple times in uh, in other contexts, both at, at Palantir and other, um, early stage companies. And so yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing that got us particularly about excited about Mosaic. Um, we're not, you know, top down thesis driven, um, but given the founder market fit here, we saw a, a big opportunity for, for what they're building. Yeah. I, re- I really, that's something that I like in all the work that I do for Mosaic, I try to lean on as much as possible. Like, I think it's really cool that we have three founders that have, you know, solved the problem before. And so. Joe, I'd ask you, like, you know, part of the investment piece is like, they need to see that there is a market for this. Like, it's not just like, hey, like they're, it's great to see that the founders have solved the problem. And so, you know, from your end, Joe, like what, what's changed maybe since like our series A in the market? Like, what have you seen? Um, are things blowing up in the space around us? Like what, what's changed now versus maybe a couple of years ago when you guys started? Yeah, I think much more adoption. I mean, we're we're helping hundreds of customers today, and we're ready to throw uh, more fuel into the fire and, and give customers uh, what they're asking for, which is you know more efficient planning, more data connections, the ability to forecast things in in new ways. And uh, we're really well positioned to uh, give the customers what they need now that we have Founders Funds backing. This isn't just going to be like a love fest for Mosaic, as much as you know, I'd love to just sit here and, and chat about all the work we do, uh, but you know. Bring someone like John on gives us an opportunity to talk about something that's really important to our customers, something that they ask about a lot. They say they use, you know, Mosaic to build their pitch decks and their board decks and things like that. And John, as somebody that, you know, is in that space all day, every day, looking at pitch decks, looking at board decks, things like that, you know, that's really what 
you know, I wanted to focus on is kind of get your, your insight into what works about this and what doesn't. And so what I want to start with is just really basic. Like, what do you think are the really basic building blocks of a great SaaS pitch deck? There's a lot of templates out there, you know, including uh, one by Mosaic, which you should, you should check out. And so I don't want to, you know, regurgitate the slide by slide breakdown. Um, but you know, to the extent you're, you are including historical metrics, I think having things around go to market efficiency, um, which could be things like, you know, your sales rep ramps, your win rates, your sales efficiency, um, your cohort based retention metrics. I think those are all table stakes for a, a great SaaS stack, particularly at the, the mid stage and, and growth stage. And those are all things that are, you know, hard to pull together for the first time. Um, but you know, Mosaic as a product make, makes those, uh, makes those metrics a lot easier to pull together and track over time. Um, and so hopefully you're not going to be, you know, acting as reactively, um, you know, if you're, if you're using their product, uh, because those are, those are metrics that you might track on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I think, you know, two conceptual things that are helpful to see, uh, particularly in a mid-stage deck is, you know, one is just a painting a really clear story of what this company becomes if things go right. Um, mm -hmm. and so it shouldn't just be a backwards looking, you know, report on, on the business. One of my colleagues often says that, you know, venture investing is, a um, your price is a, a discount on the future, not a multiple of the present. And so, um, you, you want a sense of if things go right, what does this company look like in five or 10 years from now? And I think the corollary of that is being really clear about your, your plan for the capital you're raising. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's funny. Oftentimes we'll ask founders what they plan to do with the money they're raising. And, uh, usually their answer is uh, that they wanted to raise that much because uh, they wanted a certain valuation. You know, that, that's like a misunderstanding of, of their customer. Um, for us, we want to understand where that capital gets them as a company and, and why that business, you know, assuming things do go right and it's going to look a lot better in, in 18 to 24 months from now. So th those are a few bu building blocks that I would, I would think through it, in addition to you know, some of the standard uh, pitch deck template stuff. You mentioned not wanting to like regurgitate what some of those templates will tell you. I'm going to be honest. I kind of want to go back and do some of that because there's a reason why there's so many pitch decks. Like what, can you give me like an understanding of like what the A to Z of a pitch deck is? I'm sure like you have a thought on like, you know, some people start off here and like maybe they shouldn't or, you know, maybe don't, maybe it doesn't really, really matter. I'm just kind of curious, like, is there a standard we expect A, B, C, and D? Uh, in this order, or, you know, do you see a, a whole gambit of different approaches that work? I think it is fairly idiosyncratic. And one reason it's hard to make a, a unified template across company types and industries and stages is that every company is different. And so, you know, the levers for a, a marketplace are going to be a lot different than the levers for, for a horizontal SaaS business, which, you know, might be very distinct from a vertical SaaS business. And all of those companies are going to vary a lot by stage as well. And so, I don't think there is a one size fits all and the right metrics tend to be fairly idiosyncratic depending on the company and stage. Sometimes I find it helpful to, to address the, what you expect to be the investor's biggest concerns and frame mm -hmm. the metrics around that. And so, you know, if the, if the investors might be concerned around, um, around margin structure, then maybe you, um, you have some sort of charts around gross margin over time. Whereas if you're a pure SaaS business with no customer support burden, maybe that, that piece is less relevant. Or if you're, uh, you know, if you're a marketplace, you want to show, um, like liquidity of the demand and supply side over time. Um, yep. and so, and so there might be like a set of, um, a set of charts to show for, for that type of business. Or if you're, or if you're a heavily sales and marketing oriented company, you know, you're going to, uh, you're going to want to show the, the trajectory of your sales team over time and how, um, the efficiency is trended. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think you, you want to start with what are the most risky pieces of my business and then craft a narrative around, um, and, and, and kind of build a quantitative case for, you know, why those, uh, why those risks are overblown or, uh, or, or will be de-risked over the next few quarters. Yeah, I really like that. And that, uh, kind of gets me what I want, wanted to do for a follow-up for Joe is, uh, you know, what, what do you think, Joe, how does this align with how you and, and Bij and, and Brian as our co-founders approach your fundraising rounds like when you go in to tell the story about mosaic does this sort of resonate with you or is there a different approach you've taken to to telling mosaic story um that might 
you know, help other companies? Yeah, I think to, to John's point about every pitch deck being idiosyncratic, I think that's definitely the case for Mosaic. In our case, we we actually didn't even make a pitch deck. We we showed every metric that we needed to show investors in the product, which was kind of a quasi demo and also due diligence at the same time. Um, so if, if you can get away with things like that, you, you should make the experience unique. That way you kind of stand out from the crowd because folks like John are, are probably doing dozens of these a day um, and making your mark is important. The other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about too is just like, as a founder, you should always be thinking of the narrative in your head. And it's like almost like a movie script. And it's, you know, if if we do these things this quarter, it makes the story that much better. And you have to do everything in your power to continue crafting this this really good story. And the story all leads to what is this company going to be in five years if we continue on this trajectory and, and, and really painting that idea for the future. Because the metrics that are happening today, they, they matter for sure. But what really matters is are you on the path to, to meet the goals that you set out um, in the next three or five years? And how are you going to use that capital to grow the business and make those things come true? Uh, I would say in a in a good pitch deck, you always want to have your projections, right? You want to have your executive summary and those metrics, probably some version of the product roadmap as well. But um, really nailing the projections and building the assumptions so that they're battle tested uh, is important. That's so, it's great. I mean, it's nice to hear that you guys are on the same page on sort of telling that story. And, you know, I inevitably metrics come up so much like finance people love their metrics and it's a critical part of telling that story uh nobody would get funding if there weren't any numbers to back anything up and so i i have some questions i want to get to about like which metrics to track specifically at certain stages uh but before i get there like now that we're still kind of big picture talking about narrative um john i'm curious if there are any pitch decks that you've seen in the past or ones that maybe you look to as examples online like who should companies be learning from? Are there any public ones that that you could talk about that are like, wow, like they really nailed it. Like this is how everybody should really try to approach this. Um, let's see. Two, yeah, two examples come to mind. One is one is not public. One one is kind of semi-public. So I'll start with the one that's that's not public, but I can maybe share a, a little bit. Hopefully, not too much. Uh, was the the Figma Series C pitch, and and it kind of goes back to the the idea of uh, disproving the things that investors are, are most skeptical of up front. So what investors were most skeptical of, you know, circa 2019 with regards to Figma is one, how big the, the designer TAM was, um, and two, how horizontal the, the Figma product was. And so Figma crafted the deck around those specific, um, concerns. And so, you know, they had, a, they had an interesting slide that showed, um, that they weren't just one part of the, the designer workflow, um, uh, but they showed how Figma owned the entire designer tool chain from you know, prototype to designing to, to building. And then one interesting kind of metric style slide they had was showing how Figma expanded within accounts over time. Um, and so, you know, they showed like a, a company level cohort. And so you can see, you know, within X company, it starts at, you know, one, one user and then expands to, to five and then 20 and then ultimately across the entire team. And it wasn't just designers, but also you know, engineers, product managers, founders, et cetera. Um, and so I think that was, that was a particularly compelling way to, to disarm the investor concerns around market size and horizontal appeal. Yeah. Um, the other one would be the, the rippling series B summer 2020. Um, and you know, they, they just laid out a really strong thesis around the accumulating advantages that they were building, um, which is, which is rare in, 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 in software. And, uh, this one actually is a memo that they've published publicly so you can you can you can read it online yeah, I'll um, it down. And, and learn from that yourself gotcha cool one thing i'd add to that joe is and, and john mentioned this a couple of times is being prepared with the metrics that you need for these decks so yeah maybe it's land and expand but you need to be able to track how how big the opportunity gets customer by customer and a lot of companies might wait till it's too late to start tracking those things and then they get the diligence request during the fundraise and finance teams scramble for, uh, you know, a week, 24 hours a day, trying to pull this data together, clean up historicals. So having the infrastructure in place as early as possible to start tracking the things that you know you're going to need when it comes time to fundraise is, uh, is, is such an advantage. I, I think it's a great point that that kind of leads to what I, what I mentioned before, which is this bigger conversation about metrics. And 
you guys have both rattled off like a whole bunch of different metrics that you should be looking at at certain stages. And, and I hear you on uh, the idiosyncrasy and like every situation is unique, but there's got to be like a sort of standard, like we're, we're talking about series B fundraise. So like, you know, and we'll start there is that context. Like John, there, there's got to be like a standard sort of, these are the metrics we expect to see at this stage as compared to maybe when you were at series A, or is it really like, a free for all. Like there's gotta be some expectation there, right? No, definitely, definitely not a free for all. You know, there are some, some standards. It, it is, you know, it is hard to provide a one size fits all template because yeah. the companies are so idiosyncratic. And so, but, but I think there are a lot of table stakes and then you can you know, emphasize various or, or do kind of double clicks or deep dives into various pieces that you think, uh, the audience is going to care the most about. And so, you know, sometimes it might be around, uh, or around market size and, you know, a way to do risk that is showing cross-functional use cases. You know, it might be around um, how easily you can expand the product. And so you'll want to show your, your net dollar retention, uh, which you could cut by, you know, by market segment or, 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 uh, or by cohort. And then, um, sometimes it'll be around, you know, how easily you can scale the go to market. I think scale to the go to market is probably a fairly universal one that every series B company is going to need to answer. And so you might show sales and marketing efficiency over time. And you can get pretty granular with the, the sales and marketing piece. It might be doing things like the, the magic ratio. It could be, uh, it could be, you know, sales rep, uh, perform performance over by quarter, you know, it could, it could be like, uh, CAC payback periods over time and how those have trended. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of granularity you, you can provide and, you know, which specific subset of metrics you choose on the go to market efficiency piece might might be idiosyncratic, but that is probably one of the most important categories to really drill into for the B because between the B and C, you know, that's when you're expected to start having a start, you're expected to start having a black box of, um, of dollars in dollars out. Mm -hmm. And so having more control over the levers of that black box are, uh, is, is what investors want to see. Yeah. So to, to that end, like let's, let's fast forward to series C. So, you know, Selfishly, maybe give some Joe, Joe Beige and Brian really know what they're doing already. I don't think they need uh, the insight, but let's say they didn't and we're heading into series C at some point in the future. Like what, what changes then? Like, what are some of the things we're going to add to that list? That's like, okay, like now these are our, our standards. Um, you know, we still want to see the series B stuff, but you've reached the stage. How do you track that, that black box dollars in dollars out at that point? Yeah, let's see. you know, there's all the standard go to market efficiency things that I mentioned uh, yep. that would be applicable to a Series B company. If those remain true. Sure. Um, you know, ones that that may be more popular at the later stages. Um, I think the company level efficiency matters more. Mm. Um, you know, specifically around around how much in net new air are you adding per dollar of burn. I think that's one that's that's helpful. Um, you know, breaking and and breaking that out by function. Um, so showing you know, how much your sales and marketing spend is contributing to growth. Um, and then how much of, uh, of, of a, of a GNA, of a GNA burden there is to mm -hmm. the overall PNL is, is particularly helpful. Um, probably better understanding the customer support burden. Um, I think it's hard to do at series B, but at series C and beyond there's statistical significance. So you can assess whether, um, there's a large ongoing cost to, to certain customers. And I think that can that can lead to a structurally different terminal margin profile. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? You know, I think a, a popular one is the, um, the rule of 40. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, adding your, your growth rate per, uh, and your, I think it's free cash flow margin, maybe EBITDA. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure Mosaic uh, has <laughs> the KPI in their product. So you can, you can, you can find out there, but that's, that's one that becomes more relevant at, at, at the growth stage as well. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, to ask Joe like a follow-up question here. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Mosaic sort of automating this, uh, not going to go into the whole the whole sales pitch, but there's a reality where if you can automate sort of the data collection and finance doesn't have to spend so much time collecting all this information to put numbers together, that there are like more complicated metrics that you can track to tell your story that maybe you wouldn't have had time or, you know, the ability to, to figure out without that kind of system, you're just doing everything in spreadsheets. So Joe, is there, is there a metric that, you know, has had a big impact on investors for you all that maybe when you were at like Palantir, it was like, we spent weeks trying to come up with this number. And like, finally, like we can just do it pretty quickly. Like, is there, is there anything that stands out for you there? 
Um, from the Palantir days, our, our, we really touched a lot on the land and expand metric. So when we signed a customer yeah. within three years, you know, that customer was 100x, 10x larger than it was when we first signed and being able to track, you know, the products that we were selling and how we were expanding was, was a hard day to clean up. But once we got it right, that was, that was a big metric that, that made investors really excited. I think the, the other piece kind of similar, more, more similar towards mosaics now is like, if you are a good finance person, you don't have to go out there and spend hours figuring out your gross margin and making the right allocations to gross margin. You can actually have a self-serve platform that shows your gross margin yeah. over time. And if you don't have to spend hours tracking what your gross margin is, you can actually go out to this support team and understand, hey, what are the, what are the blockers to um, making the CS process more automated or how do we improve these margins? You can actually go out there and affect change versus just sitting in the back office and pulling together these spreadsheets that are important, but like yeah. that's not where the real value com comes from. The value comes from actually going out there and improving them and telling the business where and how they can improve. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, huge selling point for, for not just our platform, but really any any automated piece of finance software in the space is just, you need that time to really affect change in your organization. And so I, I have one more metrics related question and it, it's for John. And I don't know if you remember this, John, but I, part of my job here is to really run our, our blog and like the topics that we write about and things like that. And one time, I think it was months ago, this is like October, maybe that you had emailed Joe and you were like, you guys should do an article on CAC payback periods because everyone has a different way to calculate them. And, you know, I think you had mentioned another investor. It's like, I know they calculate it this way and we think about it this way. <laughs> and so there was no way I was going to you know, not drop this in here because I never got to talk to you about what your thoughts were on CAC payback periods. So I'm curious, um, you mentioned it in maybe the series B onto series C list of, of metrics. Is there a unique perspective you have on looking at CAC payback period that maybe other investors, uh, think about differently? I think it's a particularly important metric just because it's a key driver of your return on uh, on invested capital and how quickly and efficiently you can deploy incremental dollars. And so, you know, I don't, I don't need to describe the, the calculation here. I'm sure, uh, you can read the mosaic blog for that, but, um, I think, I think, you know, a few common mistakes people make one is, um, they don't fully burden the, the CAC with, um, all attributes of customer acquisition costs. And so, you know, it could be, um, uh, you know, not including the full sales, uh, sales and marketing team headcounts. It, you know, it's it's not just your your ad spend. I think this is also tricky if there's non sales and marketing org sellers within your company. Like if your your CEO is doing the sales, they should be included in in the CAC because mm. um, you know to the extent you're you're scaling the founders, um, uh, that's going to require incremental costs to acquire your customers. And then another one is just on the you know there's like that's the CAC side of things, and then on the payback side of things, you know you need to adjust for for gross margins, and so. That could mean burdening it with customer support costs. Uh, could be make you know ensuring you have a really good handle on your your gross margin structure. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to uh, another way you can you know I think that's that gets you to like a a pretty good understanding of your CAC payback. And if you want an A plus on the test, you can break it out by by segment or um, you know by industry or or company size that you're targeting, um, just to really granularly understand how efficiently you can go after different segments, you know, whether it's like SMB versus mid-market versus, versus enterprise. Uh, gold stars for everybody if they use Mosaic to automate these things and, and really push that a little bit forward. So uh, A pluses, gold stars, all the, all the grades uh, succeeding on your pitch deck and board deck. I know, I know we're coming up on, on time. There are some hard stops here. And so the, the last thing I want to ask you, John, um, and thank you just so much for, for giving all the insight about pitch decks, but we're going to zoom way out a little bit and um, something we ask everyone that comes on, uh, it's what's something you know now that maybe you wish you knew at the start of your career um, when you were just getting ready to start a Founders Fund or something? What, one good one is um, to lean into your strengths and try not to compensate for your weaknesses. I think when you're preparing your life around uh, college admissions, mm -hmm. you might focus on being well-rounded and good in a lot of different dimensions. Um, but, but in the context of your career, you really want to lean into your strengths, you know, whether it's, uh, writing or selling or, uh, just finding, finding your superpower and, 
and honing that over time versus trying to compensate for what everybody else is good at, I think is, is probably the number one thing that you know, I, I always conceptually understood, but I think understanding it, uh, more intuitively and on, on a deeper level is, is something I've come around to recently. It's pretty well aligned with, uh, you know, what you were talking about founders funds mission being about, you know, you guys look for that founder market fit and that is kind of the epitome of leaning into strengths. It's like, well, I've solved this problem 15 times before and I'm going to go do it again and we're going to build a business around it. So, you know, it makes sense that that is a lesson you would take away from all the work that you do at Founders Fund. But yeah, so I, I just want to say thanks again. Um, I think we're coming up on time and I just want to say thanks so much for, for being here. Um, I want to give you kind of the stage here. Uh, where should people go to learn more about you, to connect with you, uh, to learn more about Founders Fund or really any of the, the companies that you all are, are working with? Yeah, let's see. Well, fa- you know, Founders Fund's easy to, easy to find. We're, uh, you know, just founderson.com. As far as myself, I'm on Twitter, Substack, but, uh, but yeah, if, uh, I'm, I'm John, a founder, so I'm pretty easy to, easy to find. So, uh, nice. yeah, come, 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 uh, ask any questions you want. Well, Joe, thank, thank you as always for adding the, the actual finance experience, to these conversations, always learn a lot from everything you have to say. And John, just, uh, thanks so much. Great to have you as part of the, uh, the mosaic family. Um, can't wait to learn more about how you guys are going to help us grow. So thanks so much for being on the roll forward and hopefully we'll do it again soon. Thanks guys. All right, thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you for checking out this episode of The Roll Forward. This show is powered by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Roll Forward wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit mosaic.tech slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes. 